We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrix. Joining me today is David Skarika, publisher and founder of Stock Chart of the Day and formerly addicted to profits.net. David, thanks for joining me again. Hey, th- uh, it's great to be here. Yeah, we had a long conversation beforehand, so no small talk, just Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes the small talk is is more interesting, but obviously the market stuff is more important. And trying to get a perspective of where we're really at, I think is obviously very important. I thought we could start by talking about what type of rate cutting cycle you would like to see from the Fed. You know, considering the seemingly dovish pivot in Powell's speech, everybody thinks of this as a time of possible panic moment in a way. But you recently looked at the type of cutting cycles that would be more favorable for certain sectors. I think first thing we had to look at, and I saw an interview with the famed hedge fund manager, Kyle Bass, recently. Mm -hmm. And I don't agree with everything that Kyle says, but like this, I kind of agree with. I do think that a lot of this is political. Mm -hmm. We are entering election year. You go back 76, 1970, 88, 92, 2004, 2008. Of course, 2008, there was a crash. But usually the Fed is in a loosening cycle during the election year. That becomes part of it. Of course, with this polarized politics that we have with Trump and against the never Trumpers and the Republicans and to the Democrats, kind of going to like nudge the Fed. We all know the Fed is somewhat political. They can say they're not, but we all know that, that, hey, you guys got to start cutting rates. And that would probably mean the stock market goes up, property prices do well, you know, people are feeling better in election year. So I think there is that aspect of it. I think there's also the aspect of, okay, we're not going to get into the debate today is if the inflation numbers are rigged or too low and real inflation is higher. But the inflation number they give out has gone down to about 3%. It was up to over 8%. And Fed funds rate is about five and a quarter. It's like they're 2% above inflation. So they can probably feel comfortable cutting it back to 4% or so. I look at these factors and look at the way the market is trading. We're going to talk about this. I'm going to concentrate on gold stocks, but I, I did a recent stock chart of the day where I talked about past cut cycles. And if you go look at like 1995, when they cut rates similar today, because they raised rates a lot in 94, and then 2019, after they they raised rates a few times in 2018, again, that was political pressure. Fed, Trump was really pressuring the Fed back in 2019. Those kind of rates cut cycles, the early 90s was the same way. The market was doing fine. It was rallying into the rate cut cycle. Whereas in like 2001, in 2008, like the last big busts in the market, you go look at them, you had housing blowing up, you had banks blowing up. In 2001, you had the entire Enron went bankrupt. You had the entire tech sector imploding. So those were giving you warning signs that this rate, those rate kite cycles weren't going to work right away because these bubbles were kind of blowing up. We're not really seeing that. We've seen a huge rally in home building stocks. We've seen the economy hold up relatively well. All cycles are different. Everyone now thinks this is going to be a big bust. Because if you look at our last three bear markets, our last couple of our bear markets, like 2020, 2008, 2000 to 2002, there was a big, these were a big bear market, 30, 40, 50%. But if you go look at the 70s, some of the bear markets in the 70s and late 60s were pretty tame, like 1966, which looks like what 2021 was most similar to, or 2022, sorry, was like 20, 25%. Last about nine, 10 months, the Fed began to cut. There was about a two to three year rally in markets. That's kind of what I'm looking at happening here. We don't want to just concentrate on the stock market. With the S&P's back near its highs, the magnificent seven stocks, as they call them, you know, the Apples, Microsofts, et cetera, they've zoomed higher. And, you know, I know a lot of Palisade listeners are gold and resource people. So I'm going to, I'll share the screen now. First of all, I'm going to show you the, the kind of type of rate cuts we're looking at. I don't think we're going to see unless the economy falls completely apart. And again, we're not seeing really the warning signs there of that. We're not going to see these steep rate cuts like we saw in 2008 or 2020, when they just go to zero and they print trillions of dollars. I think we'll never see zero interest rates again, by the way. We had a secular low in your 40 year low for the interest rate cycle and interest rate cycles tend to be 30 to 40 years in 2020, 2021. And uh, we're now headed higher. And But no cycle goes straight up. We've gone basically from zero to 5% 
on the short-term interest rates on the Fed funds. I wouldn't be surprised to me if we take back 30 to 50% of that. So we get down to three to 4% roughly on the next cycle before we head higher again. So this is the March chances of an interest rate cut. And you can see we're actually over 80% chance of a cut. Now you may say 71, but the, 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 that 11% is a half a half a point. So mm-hmm. it looks like almost surely in March, they're going to be getting to cut. Um, it looks like, again, you got another 80% chance. So it looks like uh, of another cut happening in May. And then another over 80% chance of another cut in June. And so right now we're at 525 to 550. Let's just go to December of next year. You can see there's about an 80% chance that we'll be at 375 to three to 400. Basically puts us at 150 basis points of cuts. I'm not actually as aggressive as that. I think it's going to be more like 100. That's what the Fed funds futures are telling you. So it definitely looks like we're going to start cutting rates. And by the way, I've been telling this people this for six months. I said, look, it, other than a little quarter point here and quarter point there, they are basically done raising rates and next year they're going to be cutting. And by the way, in 2021 and 2022, I was much more hawkish than most people. When a lot of people thought, oh, they're never going to go above like two or 3% like they did in 2018. I was like, no, I think they're going to go much higher, four or 5% because inflation is so high and they're way behind the curve and they have to do that. And actually, they even raised more than I thought. So they went to almost 550. Mm-hmm. So what we're looking at here is we're going to look at gold stocks and their performances in rate hike cycle. Rate David, hike cycle. if I could just play devil's advocate before we move on to the gold stuff here, thinking about how political this is and how really the coming election is not a surprise. Is it not kind of weird that Powell kind of did this in a way, an aggressive, at least verbally pivot? Couldn't they have just kind of said, you know, we're probably done and just done that over time rather than going from seemingly hawkish to seemingly dovish in a two week span? I think the issue that the Fed has, and I think the reason that rate cut and rate hike cycles are so much slower than they used to be, they don't have to shock the market anymore. Okay, if there's a crisis like 2008, 2020, they'll come in and they'll cut rates to zero and they'll print trillions of dollars because it's a crisis. Look how slowly they raised rates in 2003 to 2005. And then and even when they cut in 2000, 2002, even though we had this big dot-com bust, there wasn't really a crisis. You know, the economy had a mild recession after 9-11. So they really like to kind of slowly make their moves and then kind of, obviously you have to make a turn. And then when they make that turn, they want to give the market, they just don't want to come in, say, okay, you know, we're cutting interest rates 50 basis points overnight where people still think they're hawkish because then they think that's going to cause dislocations in the market. Imagine you did that, people still thought they were hawkish and then, In March, all of a sudden, they cut out of nowhere. You think this rally has been big. You know, the Dow could be up 1,000 points or 2,000 points in a day. Mm -hmm. And I really don't think they want those kind of extreme moves. Now, it doesn't really matter if it's going to catch 22 because all of this dovish policy, when they cut rates to zero and they print trillions of dollars, that has caused these extreme moves, these booms of 2000s real estate market or 2010s everything bull market, as people call it, or you know, the 2020, 2021 kind of bubble that happened because of zero rates. So they are kind of causing that anyhow. And that's why I remember how slow they were to raise. By the way, they did the same thing in 2022 when they began to raise rates. Kind of just like when inflation finally took off, when Russia invaded um, Ukraine, all of a sudden, all the Fed speakers got mega hawkish almost overnight. But again, they didn't raise rates. I just said at the time, I I was like, you know what? They should raise rates two or 300 basis points overnight. I know that's a shock, but inflation's 8%. They got rates at zero at the time. But they did the same thing. They all pivoted their talk, and then they slowly raise rates. And I expect that, again, unless there's a crisis where they're like, okay, we're going to cut interest rates by 100 basis points. I think the problem now is they're just going to slowly do these rate cuts. Again, it's similar to the 1995 cycle, which I'm going to show here, or the 2001-2002 cycle, where as long as there's not a shock in the economy, that's what's going to ha- that's gonna happen. So that's my opinion for it. I think that they think that that's that kind of speak and switching to speak isn't really aggressive. It's the action that's more aggressive. Right. Yeah. yeah. Just trying to understand it from that perspective of seemingly switching on a dime versus doing it over time again, because the election isn't like it's all of a sudden popped up. Well, I think maybe too top of the election factors, like that the election combined with inflation has fallen more than they probably thought quicker than they thought. And also Mm -hmm. these oil prices kind of having another whack down to 70, that also gives them some leeway. 
you know, when oil went back to 90, I thought maybe we were going to head back over 100, especially with them basically depleting the, their strategic reserve. But, of course, that didn't happen. It fell right back to 90. We have issues with oversupply in oil right now. So that – or back to the 70s, sorry, from the 90s. So I think that also gave them more leeway. And we've seen food price inflation also starting to flatten out, and that was another big problem. So I think all those factors combined with probably like some political nudging, like, hey, we don't want orange man reelected. <laughs> you got to cut rates. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that that all like um, uh, uh, played a part. And yeah, so let's just get into the technical side. So this is the three-month treasury, which basically tracks the Fed funds rate. So this is in 95, 96. You can see it went from 580 to about 500. That's like basically three, three quarters, uh, you know, 75 basis points cuts. And what we can see is, Gold stocks, where the XAU, there was no HUI back then, by, by the way, and there was no ETFs, obviously, went from about 100 during this period to 155. It went up 55% or so. And there is a time frame. I'm going to explain that in a second. So you can see the gold stocks went up 50%, 55%. The S&P went up 40 So that was a huge move in the S&P, and gold stocks still outperformed. I'll talk about this later, but there is a time frame. But the, it's I'm looking at the first 12 to 18 months when they cut rates. The opportunity cost of holding gold goes up because there's decreasing interest on your, you know, interest bearing investments. And because usually, you know, more conservative sectors like utilities, precious metal stocks, they tend to go up quicker and early in the rate cut cycle. They tend to outperform. This is really we're focusing on the first 12 to 24 months of the rate cut cycle. So that's 94, 95. So even in an epic bull market in 95, Gold stocks outperformed. So this is 2001 to 2002. This is like the greatest scenario for gold stocks, basically. In this, you can see the HUI went from 40 to 145. And then actually by 2023, it had gone to 250. And they started cutting rates in January 2001. Mm-hmm. And so you see the HUI went up. It's at the bottom here, 230%. And stocks went down 30% because we were in the dot-com bust. So that's the greatest scenario of all for a gold investor where the stock market's going down, but gold stocks are going higher. So it tracks even more capital because people are like, oh, wow, these stocks are going up 50% a year and the market's going down 10 or 20% a year. I don't want to be in the S&P. I want to be in in gold and precious metals equities. Now, granted, this was coming up from a secular low, gold being 250, everything being extremely depressed, Mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But again, it shows us in the first kind of year or two of the rate cut cycle, which kept going into 2023, by the way, gold stocks really outperformed the market. And then the last instance I'm going to show you, and look at, go look up the video that I did on my website or on Stock Chart of the Day on YouTube and on my website. I go into more of these cycles in detail, not just the ones I'm showing here, but this is to 2018 to, to 2020. So again, they, they began to cut rates in 2019. And then it was obvious by the fourth quarter when the stock market was falling in 2018, the rate hikes were coming to an end. And then, of course, they cut rates to zero. This this decline here is really just a few month thing because of a COVID and everything being shut down and kind of everything crashing together. But again, we can see that the S and P went up 35 percent during this rate cut cycle in 2019 and 2020, and the HUI went up almost 100 percent. It was at 125 percent at its highs. Mm-hmm. So again, early in the rate cut cycle. And people get into precious metals. Here's what happens usually, though, is if as the bull market matures, and we saw this in the 2010s, and we saw this in 2021, gold stocks kind of leveled off and the the stock market was in this huge bubble. What happens is I think people get more aggressive with their with their capital. They're like, gold is like a conservative investment and kind of a hedge. And they're like, no, I want to be in crypto and dot coms and and technology and you know ai or whatever it may be the flavor of the day and and, and economy's doing really well and everything's booming and money's loose i think that's my theory why it's usually this first 12, 12 to 24 month period now in the 2000s gold kept going hot right you know higher right until like just before the 2008 crash so that was a bit of an anomaly but for the most part you got that 12 to 24 month window I think we might enter a period like the 2000s again because debt is so high. And when they finish this rate cut cycle at the end of 2024 or into 2025, I think we're going to have the second round of inflation. Now, this could be for another video because I don't want to talk about too many things here. But inflation cycles usually have two or three spikes Mm -hmm. in the 70s. It happened in 
early 70s, and then it happened in 74, and then again in 80. There were three spikes in the 40s. It was the same way. There were three spikes. Probably going to see the second and third spike sometime in the mid-2020s, and then sometime in the late 2020s to early 2030s. So that we're going to see that. I think this will be the end of this kind of lull in inflation. I think we'll bottom out between 2 and 3% and then begin to move higher because of the loose monetary policy that's coming. Now, in question of how quick they will cut that you talked about, we talked about off air and, and earlier. I don't know. Like I said, the market's saying 150 basis points, which is pretty aggressive to me without a big shock in the economy. But probably 100 basis points, I would say at the least. You can see in 95 when the economy was strong, they only cut 75 basis points. I don't think we're in that kind of that 90s boom because I think there's too much debt out there and prices of everything from housing to carton of eggs is too high. Mm -hmm. But we didn't really have inflation in the 90s like that. So I do think, though, 100 basis points. And like I said, the basic math is they raised about 525. Yeah, if they take back 50%, Gets you around 275 to 300. So that's, yeah, I think that that would be ultimately though, like over a year and a half. But I think 300 to 400 on the Fed funds rate or three to 4% is basically good. And if that happens, and if you get that combined, let's look at gold bugs and sometimes the mentality. And a lot of people think I'm a gold bug and somewhat I am like long term. But gold equities, juniors, they do well in periods of prosperity and liquidity with the gold price and the stock market rising together. Mm-hmm. 95, 96 was still the best junior market I've ever seen. I started doing this then. I was only 18, 19 years old. That was Brex. That was Diamond Fields. All these huge, I've never seen junior stocks do that since then. You know, stocks that went up a thousand times in value. And then the 2000, I showed you 2000 to 2002, but the best market for the junior market, I'll put this chart up a little bit, was actually going, and you can see the rally continued all the way into 2008, was one of the best years I ever had was in 2006. And that's when the Fed stopped raising interest rates and gold and juniors rocked. And then 2009, 2011 was very good. I showed the 2018 to 2020 period. 2020 was a great year for juniors and small cap gold stocks. So again, if we kind of do see this continuation of the bull market, there's no big shocks and and a rally in gold. I think we're setting the stage, especially with gold stocks being so depressed. By the way, this is another reason I think we could have like a 2000 to 2008 type period other than consolidations that last year is because gold juniors are never been this depressed going back to say that 2000 period. A friend of mine is a stockbroker, 70 years old, same age as my father. He's been doing this for nearly 50 years since his early 20s. And he is like, this past year, he was like, I've never seen a market this bad in combination of the price action and liquidity. So I would just say if you're a gold bug and you're always hoping for the stock market to crash, I think that this kind of scenario, if the Fed cuts rates, market continues to move higher, combined with gold rallying, I think that's the best case scenario for us. And actually, the last thing I'll say is that this recent pullback in oil prices to the low 70s is also positive because we've had gold rally the last few months from 1800 to over 2000. One reason gold stocks did so well in 2020 was that when oil collapsed, that's a huge input cost, diesel fuel costs, gasoline fuel costs for operating, drilling, you know, et cetera. And if we kind of like see oil, you know, hover around here and not rally a great deal, I think that's a good thing because that input cost kind of stays lower while the underlying asset that you're selling, gold and silver, rallies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like these different environments where there's liquidity and it's not people aren't running for the hills by being shocked by any of these big downfall moments in the stock market seems like a much better environment for gold. But if you just go to youtube.com, just so you know, this last Scott Day, we'll put the link before, you'll get all these kind of videos, right? Yeah, you'll see I'm a travel vlog, not from my main YouTube page. But anyhow, um, yeah, I agree with you. All those kind of different scenarios that you're talking about these shocks that you see in the market okay 2020 came out of the blue of course the warning signs were there because everyone around the world was closing down their economy because of covid Mm -hmm. and the u.s is kind of the last to do so so the u.s has the most kind of libertarian laissez-faire kind of culture of all the western countries you go look at 2007 you know all these banks were blowing up or all these bailouts were happening 2000 2001 like enron which is one of the biggest companies in the world at the time was the biggest bankruptcy in the world at the time in 2001 Kind of went, you know, bankrupt at the time. 
So I, I think that um, you know that 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 sort of thing is 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 not happening right now. You know, we're seeing there's, there's a rise in bankruptcies because of higher interest rates. We're seeing some people struggle to make their mortgage payments, especially if they're on the variable rate mortgage because of cost of housing. But I think that essentially we're not seeing anything like systematic right now, and I think that's a sign that this is kind of a normal. Again, 2019 it happened, and we're kind of used to these emergency rate cut cycles. 2008. 2001 after 9-11, 2020 after COVID. And it looks like actually for only the second time in that 25 year period, you know, 1998, the cut rates because of LTCM crisis, right? Only like the last 25 years, this is probably out of like whatever the, I guess that's one, two, three, four right cut cycles. This is the fifth one. And this is going to be, you know, only like only the second one were, or actually this will be the sixth one, this will be only the second one that they're only doing it out of basically, you know, basically is they just want to, inflation's come down, probably getting some political pressure, but they're just doing it because they have leeway now to cut rates. Remember, part of the reason they kept raising rates, they're probably just hoping, well, probably two reasons. And they probably knew if something broke, okay, we're if we're high up here, we have a lot of leeway to cut rates. And then if something didn't break, they're like, well, yeah, we, then we can just slowly cut them. So anyhow, this is the page, like I said, and you'll see I have a, I started really this back in June and, and yeah, you can go on here and look at Pat's, uh, these charts. I talk about these kind of cycles and the things we're talking about here. And actually I'm starting a new series. I'm actually going to do the video right after we stop this interview here. It's classic traders and what they do in terms of trades, great right? mm-hmm. trades that they've had. So I've done one on Jim Dines. I don't know if you remember who he was. He was a newsletter writer. He mm-hmm. predicted that the internet boom back in the nineties. I did one on John Templeton when he bought stocks in the late thirties that boom during the war. And, you know, every week or two, I do a trade by a great investor and tell you how they came to the conclusion, of this trade, how they did it. It's just, so it's a cool thing. And, and instead of just talking about a great investor's career, I'm kind of looking, delving in detail into one successful trade that they had and mm-hmm. how they came to the conclusion to do it. And it's interesting because, you know, some of these guys are technical people. Some of these people are uh, fundamental people. Some of them are contrarians, some of them momentum traders. So it's just some of them are hedge fund managers, some of them newsletters writer, writers. As you're talking about that, you're bringing up the idea that Jim Dines had this really long or maybe should have had this really long investment horizon of, of 15 to 20 years. So, you know, do you see good lessons for being able to hold an investment for that long? Oh, yeah, for sure. I talk about Amazon, right? And he was a huge bull on Amazon. And yeah, here's the chart right here of Amazon. You can see in, in the video, Amazon went from like 50 cents or so from what he recommended it to $150 oh. in about 25 year period. Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, 300 times on your money. And one thing I was critical though, is Dines had something called the four horsemen of the internet. It was exactly what you're talking about. He said, just hold these stocks basically forever for 20 years. The internet's the next big thing. They're going to make tons of money. These are the four leaders. And they were AOL, Yahoo, CMGI, and Amazon. Now, CMGI went bankrupt. But Yahoo and AOL, even though they kind of didn't become leaders anymore, even after the bus, over a 15-year period to when both companies got taken private, AOL was taken over. Yahoo just took themselves private because Yahoo had a large holding in Alibaba. So basically, they were just becoming a holding company for Alibaba. So it made no sense for the stock to trade anymore. So they just private. You're still up dozens and dozens of time. And then I guess talked about Amazon. But Dines, he sold most of them. He got stop losses. I think the problem with writing a newsletter is, and I, I talk about this in the video, is, and this is kind of why I've gone to the stock chart of the day. I know it might sound a little ironic because I'm saying it's stock chart of the day. But my own kind of investment philosophy in the Patreon version of stock chart of the day is like, look, these are companies I like. We're waiting for maximum pessimism, we're waiting for assets to get cheap. And when assets get cheap, we're going to buy these stocks when, when things are, are cheap and on sale. And then you got to wait, whatever, three months, six months, a year, or even two years for them to move and then maybe hold them for years, as you were saying. And the problem with Dines is he didn't want, say, some stock like Amazon. You know, it went from 50 cents to they've done a split since to $5. It was like 100 at the time. And then back to 50 cents. And people are like, well, you held up and down and, and I don't want to subscribe to your newsletter. So you kind of just get it off your list. But if Dines had followed his original advice, just own this forever, one CMGI went under, but the th- other three of the four did fantastically over a 15 year period. And Amazon would have been enough just, you know, you put $100,000 in at 50 cents, 
do the math on <laughs> 300 to one, right? Or even 10,000 on 300 to one, right? It's like, that's the kind of thing you have to do. And it took me a long time to learn that. Like, I didn't really learn that, I'd say the last five years, because especially when you're, I started so young, when you're in your twenties and thirties, you want to make this money in 12 months, 24 months, all of that sort of thing. David, it would be interesting to kind of get your thoughts on the challenge, let's say, of, especially when you've been looking at gold for so long, understanding the challenge of trying to stay out of the doom and gloom that seems to really inundate the gold space, especially. And especially as you're writing a newsletter, or you have been writing a newsletter for such a long time, how do you kind of stay out of that lane and try and figure out what's actually happening versus what the the hearsay is of the time? I think it took me a long time too. One thing I'm actually in this same video, and if anyone wants to write me at addicted to profits at hotmail.com, that's no problem because I'll send you the exact link to mm-hmm. this certain video. I talk about how I got involved. So basically, I read this, I read this book called Bankruptcy 1995 by Harry Figge. And it was basically about how you know the government was going to go bankrupt. And this was written in 1993. And he was totally right on with everything he said. That the debt's actually gone up faster than he thought. But of course, he missed calculated because who would have thought that the debt would go from three to 30 and interest rates, you know, to zero like that, you know, that doesn't make sense, right? You mm-hmm. would think people would want more return on a higher uh, risk asset, which is debt becomes as you accumulate more of it. So then I got, I read Jim Davidson, Doug Casey and all kinds of doom and gloom stuff. So I was kind of into that. And I was a gold bull. So I was always poo-pooing like new technologies. I did trade the internet stocks because I liked dines at the time, but you know, when, when, when like 3D printing or, or crypto, I was always like kind of a critic. And I think you just have to accept the fact, okay, you want to be in these sectors with high growth and then have booms. You know, there's going to be bubbles in them. Obviously, the question is, can you get up the right time? If you get out a little early, I think that's fine as well. So I think you just have to be open and have a positive stance and go, look at, look at the way we live now. I live in Eleuthera, Bahamas, this isolated island, and I have basically high-speed internet here. I can talk to you. You're in Calgary. And 40 years ago, if I was going to move to Eleuthera, Bahamas, I would basically have to already be rich or I just have to build a house here and maybe come when I vacation because there was no technology to do that. So what I'm trying to say is the spiral of technology is is upwards. And even with all these debt problems and issues we have, there's going to be, still be exponential growth going forward in humankind, in, in technology, and that sort of thing. So you have to be open-minded to that and realize and look for kind of like where the next boom is kind of going to be. But I think at the same time, this is where being a gold bug comes in is you also have to be aware of the inherent risk. And this is why the people that are just bulls get wiped out in all these busts because, and I think a lot of crypto people are like this because, you know, we've had two massive busts in crypto. Okay, Bitcoin has held up well, but tons of these coins have basically gone to zero or lost like 99%. And I think you have to look at the risks are, yeah, there's too much debt in the world. And at some point, it's going to cause a massive sovereign type crisis. And then there's going to be drastic measures to sell it, to solve it. Like you go look what's going on in Argentina right now. This may sound extreme, but I think to a certain extent, all countries in the West are going to become Argentina. Mm -hmm. Where because of this mismanagement and massive debt and a longer term period of higher inflation, people are some point are going to get sick of it and then look for drastic measures to solve it. And you have to be aware that even though I've thought this was going to be ha- happened for decades, at some point that will kind of happen. So I think that's where the gold you know, bug or being a gold bull does play a part, right? Because gold will do very, very well when you're in the end game kind of spiral of that. Like, you know, like look what gold has done for anyone in Argentina you know, in Argentinian peso terms. Forget, it's done great in dollars in the last 25 years when it's gone from 250 to 2000. But, you know, in peso terms, Argentina's had numerous, they defaulted in 2001. They've had hyperinflation mostly for the last 10 years. And it's done fabulous there. Same thing, anyone living in Venezuela. So I think you have to like be cognizant of the risks, but also be open to the opportunities. That's a great way to put it, Dave. And I think maybe a great spot to kind of wrap up on if if you don't have anything else that you'd like to leave our listeners with? No, all, all, all I'd ask is like, uh, like I said, right now, go to the uh, stock chart of the day. The best thing is I do have sponsor companies that help me run it. I do have a small Patreon. It's only 70, sorry, $7 a month. 
But anyhow, the best part of Stock Chart of the Day, just try it out. Don't, I'm not asking for a subscribe. Just try it out. Like I said, I do, I do three to five of these videos a week. Mm-hmm. The best part of it, like I said, is the price. It's free. See the videos and see you know, what I have to say about markets. And you know what I'll also do in it. I just don't talk my macro theme, themes. You know, if a big name stock has a big move, I'll make that the chart of the day. You know, Apple has, has its earnings. I'll talk about that. And the sponsor companies, uh, when they have news, Actually, Nevada King is one of my sponsors, and they recently just put out an interview. And you know, they've had news recently, and I'll, I'm going to talk about. So, we also get some information on some of these juniors that I follow and own. Interest. Yeah, that that's basically it. And like I said, it's very simple. It's YouTube at Scott Day. I just made it short to make it easier for people to join, and that's it. Yeah, no, this is this is a great conversation. I'm really trying to get away from just talking about gold and gold stocks, but the irony right now is because <laughs> we're starting this rate cut cycle. I do think we're going to be in a great 12 months for gold and gold stocks. Well, I appreciate that you have that perspective that, you know, not only being solely focused on the gold stocks, you've looked at these other areas and identified at this time, of course, time will tell, but at this time, it does look like this will be a favorable opportunity for the gold stocks. You know, I think they will be. And and like I said, they're, they're really cheap too. That's another thing to take into hand right? because there's been so much price destruction in them. I would say like, you know, the seniors are pretty good value, but the juniors especially are about as cheap as I've ever seen them. And right now we have this, I guess we keep saying we're going to end. I do like to end on this note. With the juniors in particular, we got gold over 2000. It looks like it's going to break out. And the juniors, because they've suffered so badly at the end of the year here, they're seeing all this uh, tax loss selling. So they're even more depressed. Like a lot of them are trading, you know, where they were when gold was 1400. So I think it's a great opportunity in them. Of course, that's risk capital. That's risky money. But I think if for your small amount of risk capital, the gold and precious metal juniors are probably the best value in the market right now, especially in the resource markets. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. David, of course, stock charts of the day, as you said, and at David Skarika on Twitter as well. Dave, thanks so much for your time today, man. Yeah, thanks. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.